Hey everybody out there, this is Chris Merritt and I'm the State Historic Preservation Officer here in Utah. As we deal with these uncertain times, our staff here at the State Historic Preservation Office decided to bring you small snippets of ongoing research or interesting topics that we've been involved in as a way to break up some of your distancing at home. So today I'm going to bring in a little bit of my dissertation research that I did at the University of Montana, but it overlaps very strongly with our history here in Utah, and that's the role of the Chinese railroad workers. So in American history, there's no bigger story than the Transcontinental Railroad, especially when we start thinking about the settlement and development of the American West and the pushing out of Native people. The contribution of Chinese railroad workers cannot be overstated that as we, as Euro-Americans, started settling the American West, there was a lot of industrialism, but not a lot of labor. And so the Chinese were able to be uh, immigrated in a way that allowed them to fill in those needed labor niches in the American West. First, I want to just very quickly go over that when we think of China, we need to think of not a single group, but a very complex society with dozens of different ethnicities and languages. And when we look at 19th century immigration from China, a lot of these folks came from Southeast China. This is a linguistic map showing the sort of different language groups. And you see South China has some of the most diversity of any part in China. The Chinese that left the country in the 19th century were really fleeing a series of issues. One being civil unrest through rebellion. Uh, there was open warfare between the Chinese government and European powers, which led to opening of port cities, what we call the Opium Wars, but it was really about the British Empire forcing open trade into China. And then, of course, open rebellion. A lot of the people in China at the time did not see their government as legitimate and the defeats on foreign powers led them to also think about that this was not a good government for them long term. The Taiping rebellions was that civil unrest and so if you look at these numbers in those 14 years 20 million were killed and 30 million potentially dispossessed or what we would call refugees. It is those 30 million that really became the core of the Chinese that left the country. In the 19th century Chinese went anywhere. Estimates 30 million people between 1850 and 1900 left China in search of opportunities to support their family at home, many of which came to the United States. In the United States, they faced a whole host of very restrictive legislative acts to limit their immigration, culminating in the 1882 Exclusion Act, which was the first federal law specifically barring one nationality from immigrating to the United States. Uh, it was renewed in 1892 in the Geary Act provision, which now became the first federal law requiring a photo ID for the Chinese still in the country. And so this all came to be, and it really limited the story of the Chinese in the 19th century because we really focus on these negative aspects. But when we look at the American West and even parts of other, uh, other parts of the United States, the Chinese filled very needed roles. So they filled in minor cl mining claims, railroad workers, uh, Chinese gardens, plantations, industrial factories, anything that these refugees could earn money to send home to support their family. Many of these Chinese would have loved to stay in the United States, but those restrictive legislative acts left them with no option but to return home or abandon their own family. Now that brings us to the case in point, the Transcontinental Railroad. If you look at the first four transcontinental railroads in North America, or the first three transcontinental railroads in the United States, Chinese labor contributed over one half of all the labor for the Central, Southern, and Northern Pacific combined. Three quarters of the labor for the Central Pacific's construction. So without Chinese labor, these main railroads that tied the east and west parts of our country would not have been completed at all, or perhaps not even as quickly or efficiently or as cost effective because they could pay the Chinese laborers much less than their white counterparts. In 1863, with the initiation of the Transcontinental Railroad's construction in Sacramento from the Central Pacific side, the Chinese were not the first population used. They, uh, the railroad builders decided to try to use white crews but they found them to be unreliable because every time there was a new gold strike, those miners would go disappear up into the mountains. So, in 1864, they experimented with a small crew of Chinese workers outside Sacramento, and they were so effective that railroad company magnets wanted 15,000 as quickly as they could, because there was a race to Utah. You can see in the comments from Leland Stanford in 1865, that he really saw the effectiveness of Chinese labor. Uh, his reports from his foreman said they worked effectively as a group. 
they uh, supplied their own food and shelter, and this was enough for him to put out an order to get 15,000 laborers. Now, the history books are a little bit quiet here because we don't have a, a really great count of the number of Chinese laborers because of the way we handled their immigration and because of the, railroad, the way the railroad handled their employment records. Where they would just say, oh, so-and-so hired 100 Chinese. Well, that doesn't give us names. That doesn't how many of those 100 were previously on the railroad or not. So 15,000 from Leland Stanford's call. And then later, when we look at some of the other numbers, uh, J.H. Stowbridge, who, which, which was the uh, Central Pacific Railroad's lead engineer, he estimates in 66, 67, 11,000. So I think it's effective to say 11 to 13,000 Chinese laborers worked on the Central Pacific at its peak. Now, those big numbers were as they were crossing the high sea. Those high Sierras were labor intensive because of the granite tunnels they had to construct being built on four faces, you know, one from each end. And then they had to build a uh, tunnel down through the center to start working on four faces at once. In some places, they were only able to blast and chisel out about an inch to an inch and a half a day. Uh, that meant this was really labor intensive. Many Chinese lost their lives from blasting accidents and avalanches. These winters up in the Sierras were really, really bad, similar to the Donner Party era in 1846-47. But after we got out of the high Sierras, the Pacific really started cruising. The Great Basin through Nevada and western Utah really allowed a quick construction. In this period, they were averaging about three to four miles per day, which was really a dramatic amount of labor. But that also meant all the supplies, the wooden crosscut ties coming from the mountains in the high Sierras, the steel being shipped around South America or across the Panama Canal to San Francisco and then in. That meant that this was a moving machine of humans and supplies. And as they raced towards Utah, the Union Pacific was coming the other way from Omaha, Nebraska hoping to beat and build the best line to get the lucrative uh, government contracts and allotments of land. So I'm going to fast forward for the brevity of time to May 10th. So in 2019, we celebrated the 150th, 150th anniversary of this magnificent event. Look at this photo. You do not see Chinese faces. You do not really see many laborers' faces at all, whether they're Irish, the African-American, the Mormon, the Chinese. This was really an event on May 10th to celebrate the wedding of the rails, but really the people that financed it and some of the powerful political leaders here. Not really an honor to the workers themselves. Now, both companies themselves honored the workers and said that their contributions were obviously important. But the lack of the Chinese in this photo in particular really speaks to the racism of its period, but also some factors I want to talk about in part two of this talk that by the point of this photo, the railroads were starting to be rebuilt because this was built for speed and not quality. And so in the next part two, I want to talk about May 11th and May 12th and all the way up into the 1930s and 40s. And in particular, the Utah portion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And also get into a little bit more of what you were teased on the archaeology of these stories. So I you will tune in for next time on the Transcontinental Railroad in Utah beyond May 10th. Uh, also, we talked a little bit about the Chinese railroad population and their demographics, and then as we get to it, some Transcontinental Railroad material culture to help you understand how archaeologists view the past. So thank you all for listening, and stay safe and stay healthy.